it's around 7.02 p.m. And we'll take attendance really quick. Commissioner Coleman is absent. Commissioner Valencia. Present. Mr. Perez. Present. Commissioner Fulp Cook. Here. Commissioner Wise. Here. Vice Chair Ennis. Here. And Commissioner Vaitla is here. Thank you all for making it tonight. This is sadly the last meeting of our esteemed colleagues, Matthew Wise and Georgina Valencia. Uh, uh, can I have a motion to approve the agenda? I'll move to approve the agenda. Do we have a second? I second. Commissioner Fulp Cook seconds, and I will do a vote. Commissioner Ennis? Yes. I vote aye. Commissioner Perez? Yes. Commissioner Valencia? Yes. Commissioner Wise? Yes. And Commissioner Fulp Cook? Yes. Motion to approve the agenda passes 6 0. And we will move on to brief announcements from staff, commissioners, or liaisons. Um, I'll go ahead and um, offer a few thoughts um, since I don't hear, unless staff has some things to offer up. Kelly, Dago? I guess not. Okay. I have no announcements from staff. Okay. okay. Um, well, uh, you may remember that um, the last meeting of the Housing Element uh, Committee was May 20th, and um, there were some recommendations, 10 recommendations that came out of that meeting, and I don't know, probably should have been a little more prepared for tonight, but being as it's my last meeting, I really didn't think about it till just now. Um, it's probably something that the commissioners should familiarize themselves with as far as the recommendations. Um, I can tell you the first two recommendations were in line with um, the housing draft housing trust fund. And um, I mean, I, I don't want to read them all to you because it's just too much to really um, talk about tonight or offer in brief comments. But I do think it would be good for um, the commission to take a look at it. Um, what else? Uh, there was June 15th was the city council um, public meeting on the housing element. And um, there was a tremendous amount of public uh, comment. And I will say that the public comment and actually city council comment was very positive with regards to the draft housing trust fund. So that has been really um, nice to see and, and um, observe. Uh, beyond that, that's it for the moment. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I was hoping at some point this meeting, it could be now, it could be later, but um, not to put Commissioner Wise, Commissioner Valencia on the spot, but it would be nice to just uh, maybe just hear from you guys about parting thoughts, uh, lessons learned, closing arguments, however you want to think about it, but just to, to share sort of your... Yeah, at the end of the agenda um, at uh, commission staff, commission and staff communications, um, I added bullet, bullet points. Gotcha. So Got departing it. commissioners feedback to commission and staff. Great. Thanks, Yago. I didn't see that. If there are no more brief announcements, we will move on to public comment. At this time, any member of the public can address the commission on matters which are not listed on this agenda or are listed on a consent calendar, please limit your comments to three minutes and state your name for the record. Okay. Um, I see Alan Hirsch uh, with his hand raised. Let's see. And I think we may need to allow him to share screen perhaps, Doug, or do you have the slides? I have the slides. Yeah, got you. Hi, do you have my slides up? I can't see exactly. Uh, yes, they're up now. Thank you. My first slides. I, I'm, ca I'm calling in because we're redoing the city tree ordinance and that overlaps with housing because our urban forest affects the quality of the housing in our community. I know that your community is 
is working very hard on that and it and makes it believable, especially with climate change. So that I'll bring this to your attention. The second slide has a picture of College Park on it. I hope you can see this is the baseline. This is a, an ideal neighborhood. There's a number of neighbors like this, but you can see how the, the street is even is invisible because of the tree shade. These are all city trees. Next slide, slide number three. You'll see that the, this, this neighborhood was invented by city, city. It was a treeless area in 1940, and the city has invested in planting trees. You can see the sidewalks there, you see a narrow strip, that's where they planted trees. But the next slide, slide number four, shows you what happens in other neighborhoods. The this is an this is a, the up. Uh, the Drake Apartments. This is not atypical of apartment complexes. They're surrounded by parking lots that are largely unshaded. And those parking lots, the asphalt is usually 45 degrees more than the air temperature. Maybe 140, 150 degrees or within our peak weather. Like getting out of your car into an oven, you're living on an oven, you live in these buildings. And there is a, in the next slide, slide number five brings to the next point is that this is not quite right because there is actually a city ordinance that requires it under code that every parking lot has at least 50% shade. And we are not mostly, mostly forcing the, the developers to design the parking lots to that specification. There's a mathematical error that's been ignored. And the next thing is that there's, there's no enforcement. So if the trees are planted, they're not maintained and there's no enforcement of that. And even when the parking lots are modified, we aren't, far, aren't requiring the develop, landlord to retrofit. Next slide. Um, so this is, this, is, this is a mobile home court in South Davis, Davis Creek. You can see that we don't have any regulation about people spaces around housing. This is a terrible place to live. We need to be, if we talk about affordable housing, it needs to be livable affordable housing. This is an unacceptable place, I would suggest. This is the mobile home. But Yolo, Grancho, Yolo is better, but it's still not enough trees. Next slide, slide number seven. This, you can plant park trees in parking lots in a shade, shade complex. This is a, a number of park apartment complexes between Covell and A Street along the railroad tracks. On the far left is John Whitcomb's Cranbrook Apartments are wonderful trees. There's actually more trees in the parking lots than there are around the buildings. But you can see the, on F Street, there's no parking lots that have treeless. And, we, and even when those retrofits on those parking lots, the city is not enforcing it. Next slide. So what we need to do is focus on apartment complexes with enforcement, a parking lot plan, and better maintenance plans and really the TTC has to change its culture to actually enforce the trees as if they are part of the building code. Next slide, rental housing, mini dorms. When they're single family terms turned into mini dorms, we need to make sure there are trees in the front yard because landlords will tend to basically not maintain the trees because they cost money. Next slide, slide three is, is bus stops. Low income people using bus stops, we have not Put enough emphasis on shading bus stop. This is a new bus stop on F and Covell, right? No, those F Street apartments. There's no shade here. This is not a nice place to wait in the sun. We can do better about trees. This is no one's paid attention to this thing. I hope we, the city will pay attention to the new ordinance and plus the culture of the city will actually make an emphasis on trees. Thank you very much for listening to me. And uh, I know, I know we're, all, we're all on the same page on this thing. We just need to pay attention. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. That was an impressively efficient presentation. Thank you so much and informative. Appreciate your work on that. Anyone else, uh, Tago? Um, let's see. Not seeing any other hands raised. Okay, great. We'll move on to the consent items. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from last meeting? This is uh, Commissioner Valencia. I'll make a motion to approve. Commissioner Valencia, motion. Is there a second? A second. Commissioner uh, Vice Chair Ennis, seconds. Do we, uh, let's have a vote. Commissioner Wise? Yes. Commissioner Fulp Cook? Yes. Commissioner Perez? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Valencia? Yes. I will vote yes. And Vice Chair Ennis? Yes. Yes. Uh, motion passes 6-0. And we will go on to the regular items. And I believe we have a presentation from UC Davis Aggie Compass. Leslie. Hi, everyone. OK. Just Hi, Leslie, do you have a presentation or slides you're going to share? Um, no. Okay. But... You know what, if you let me do a screen share, I okay. can. Uh... Okay, yeah, you should have those permissions already. Great, hold on one second.
Okay, how's that? Can you see the website? Yes. Terrific. Okay. Well, it's nice to be here again and be able to provide an update on the services that we offer. There have been a lot of changes and a lot of things have also stayed the same. So I think, so we, we have our usual services, which all pertain to food, housing, finances, and mental wellness. Now, recently the um, basic needs committee for the UC made a recommendation to both the UC Office of the President and to the state to change the definition of basic needs to, to broaden it really and include um, transportation, um, hygiene, and also uh, physical wellness and help for children of students. So that definition has been broadened. Um, so you'll see more and more kind of resources coming online in those areas, but it was that that recommendation was just made and um, approved. We so some of the things that we offer in that area that you're uh, already familiar with, those of you that were at uh, my last presentation, would be primarily in the area of food. We offer CalFresh uh, enrollment assistance for our students until COVID happened and we went on lockdown. This included um, a CalFresh specialist from Yolo County who had a permanent office in our Aggie Compass Basic Needs Center and did enrollment services and also interviewed, did the county interview for students who were applying for CalFresh. Now, since COVID, everything went online, and Max, who was our amazing uh, CalFresh specialist from the county, went back to his county office and also worked remotely. So we're working with the county right now to, Max got a promotion, which is awesome, um, but now we're working on getting his replacement in the door for us uh, for when we open full service in the fall. Or I should say, we've always been full service, but opening in person in the fall. So right now we provide um, enrollment assistance to students and you can kind of do that in a number of ways. You can walk into the center, you can call, you can apply online and then make an appointment with one of our CalFresh team. Um, and you can see all those things. Uh, on our website there. We also have our Fruit and Veggie Up program that got changed a little bit for COVID, but uh, where we switched to picking up grocery bags weekly for students of fresh produce. Uh, and then after that, we were delivering fresh produce in like a farm fresh to you type thing, uh, only it was free to students. And though that produce came from and still comes from the student farm, Tandem Properties, who has an organic farm, Save Mart, Nugget. Um, some of it is, is fresh and freshly picked that morning organic. I'm talking about Tandem in particular and the student farm. And some of it is uh, what we might call recovered. And that's stuff from the markets that um, is taken off the shelves before, you know, to make room for other stuff. So it's not that it's bad, it just might not be as pretty as the other stuff. Um, so we reclaim that and, and give it out. Um, the ways in which our food recovery or our food programs have expanded this year are that we now offer um, a, a CalFresh equivalent program so CalFresh, you may or may not know, is, is the um, federal program for um, formerly called food stamps. Now it's called SNAP in California, uh, rebranded it CalFresh. Um, so it provides up to $200 uh, a month for groceries. Um, but some students are not eligible based on their uh, citizenship. 
And so we now offer an equivalent program for um, students who don't qualify because of that reason, either because they're international or they're AB 540 undocumented students. And this provides them with um, uh, a monthly stipend for groceries. We have uh, an emergency grocery card and dining common swipes program. Those are, that's for students who come in as food insecure, skipping meals. We can meet with them. Um, and talk that uh, through and offer them those kinds of resources. So when we're talking to students, we do that with the case manager. And I think the last time I was here, we were talking about hiring a case manager, but we hadn't yet. So now we have Howard Chanel, who's our um, uh, case manager. He works mostly with the numerous housing grants that we offer and rental assistance for students and offer also provides triage to students in distress and refers them to counseling services or makes an appointment with um, uh, a clinical case manager on campus. So Howard is kind of in charge of all the housing related, grant related uh, resources that we have. Um, and let's see other areas that we've expanded around food. I think that that covers the food. Now the biggest area uh, that we've expanded in over this last year is in housing. So we've been talking, let's see, I think it's been two years since we started our grant programs for rental assistance and security deposit granting uh, and things like that. But um, last year as COVID, well, COVID was probably like five months into it when we launched our college focused rapid rehousing program. As you know, uh, the city of Davis has, um, Empower YOLO that does a form of rapid rehousing and also Davis Community um, Meals and Housing. Um, so we ended up partnering with Lutheran Social Services. They do a college focused rapid rehousing program for Sac State and some of the community colleges. And we have partnered with them uh, and with Tandem Properties to have 12 beds available, that was starting this last fall for the, this program. And so they hired a case manager who's now kind of part of the Aggie Compass team. And what happens is uh, we will locate or a student will refer themselves into this program. Uh, and this is a student who would normally be homeless. And we provide some intensive college focused case management. And what that means is kind of a combination of the traditional, here are the services to get you back on your feet. Here's food, um, here's housing, here's uh, mental health services, but also the college uh, focus part is how can we, you know, what support do you need academically? Um, do you need to meet with your advisor? Who is your advisor? Let's talk to your um, professors about whether you need accommodations in these areas. Um, so we'll identify these students, provide um, some focused case management, um, temporary, it's actually, I would say long-term temporary housing it goes three to six months in one of the uh, tandem apartments. And um, they, the students who are in this program pay graduated amounts of rent. At first it's free, then they pay a little bit more and a little bit more, a little bit more every month. And this money goes into an escrow account that is then given back to them at the end of their time with us so they can use it for um, security deposits to get a permanent permanent housing in the city of Davis. Uh, and so that is that program that launched in the fall. Unfortunately, our 12 beds moved down to a COVID eight beds. The program's been maxed out all year long and we now will transition it to the green, which is that new uh, building out at, or all the new buildings out at West Village. Um, and we'll have 20 beds this fall. We anticipate them being full as well. 
Um, another thing that we've launched in the area of housing this last year, this will be our second year doing it in the fall, um, our rental subsidies out at the green. Um, the chancellor committed to offering 15% of the new beds that come online um, with a little, a modest kind of affordability stipend. Uh, so 150 beds will be offered at, uh, with a $100 a month reduced rent. Uh, students apply for this, and so it's it's awarded to them based on need. Um, this is a program that Aggie Compass has partnered with student housing on, student housing and dining services. Um, it's a program that should, uh, it's sustainable, so the Aggie Compass is providing kind of seed money to get it going for a couple of years, and at which point the university itself will take over payment on this. So these beds will always remain at a reduced rate. And um, if you're like me, you're thinking, hey, a hundred bucks isn't gonna get anybody from you know sleeping in their car to an apartment. Um, and I completely agree. Um, however, it is part of a group of services that we can offer to students that will help them become more uh, basic needs secure as we go along. So those are our two big housing things that we've done this year. Um, we also offer emergency housing, which is in the form of uh, hotel vouchers at Davis uh, Hotels. Um, we put students up there for anywhere from one night to um, I believe the max is 30 days. Um, and that's for students who are um, escaping domestic violence situations or um, during the uh, power outage, we put up a lot of our students in Davis hotels uh, because a lot of our properties were affected um, and a lot of, of um, Davis properties were affected um, at different housing complexes where our students live. So we uh, helped out by putting them into hotels for numerous days. Um, and then sometimes we end up with a student who has a gap of about a week where they need to get um, their lease ended, they've been evicted, their new place doesn't start for another, uh, another week. I would say our biggest challenge in that area is locating students who, and identifying students who are living in their cars currently. We know there are a fair amount of students out there who do that. It is very difficult to get in touch with them. Um, they, you know, as you can imagine, they, they don't react too well to having their windows knocked on. <laughs> you say, hey, we're here to help. And they're like, no, I'm not. I don't need any help, you know, so it's, it's, it's hard to kind of build that relationship. Um, we look forward to, um, unfortunately, Ryan Collins uh, moved on, but we look forward to working with his uh, replacement with the city of Davis and uh, um, homeless uh, coordinator there to try and locate these students. And we've done ride alongs with the UC Davis police um, to try and locate where they are. Um, we expect a lot more of this in the fall uh, possibly than we have ever had, because um, I'm sure many of you know what's going on with the housing right now, but UC Davis in our properties have waiting lists, huge waiting lists for our properties. We're all booked up. Um, and the city is not booked up. So what we expect is happening is that students were kind of playing the odds on whether they would come back in the fall and didn't wanna sign leases that they wouldn't be able to get out of if they couldn't come back. And they had more traction with the university to get out of leases if that decision was made. So what we anticipate are students coming back and not having a place to stay or uh, in August and September, really being in a position where they're like, ah, I thought I was gonna take these classes remotely. There's no option to do that. I haven't gotten a lease yet. So 
we, um, we expect a lot of scrambling that our office will be handling and a lot of, just a lot of unprepared students, which could lead to more students living in their cars um, until they can find something uh, better. So let's see, let me just make sure I covered all the new stuff. Um, the pantry, the ASUCD pantry, still going strong, love that place. Um, that is run by students at ASUCD and we help out. Um, we also, uh, Aggie Compass, um, worked with the Graduate Student Association to launch the GSA pantry in the new Walker Hall. Um, we also support the Solano Park Pantry, um, which is run by students. Um, and we have a mobile pantry now, which didn't get much action this year. And um, we have pantries embedded in some of the centers. So we have this kind of whole pantry network going on. <laughs> okay, I think, we launched a legal help desk last year that helped students um, to work with their landlords and leases that they weren't let out of and the property managers. Um, we do not provide legal services, but we connect students with uh, legal services that are available to them through the um, Graduate Student Association, the ASUCD, also Legal Services of Northern California for our students that can't, um, can't afford representation. Um, we do many more like referrals between units and uh, departments on campus, but that pretty much covers it. This fall, we have a lot going on. Um, as I said, I explained to you a little bit of what we anticipate for the fall. We're launching several, um, you know, along with these services come um, some of the um, basic needs skills building. So we try and kind of do upstream interventions to offer students um, skills building in the area of teaching kitchens and cooking classes, um, uh, basic kitchen knife handling, um, we do some financial uh, literacy programs, um, why you should have car insurance and rental insurance or not, but so that you understand uh, all about that sort of thing. We have toiletries closet where you can come and get um, menstrual health products and, um, and deodorant and all that kind of stuff that you might need. Um, we have linen closet. Hmm. Anyway, I think that's about it. Does anybody have any questions or want to talk about any other basic needs areas? Thank you, Leslie. That was that was great. Uh, There's quite a quite a few new pieces of information for me. So that was, that was awesome. Uh, I have a few questions, but uh, maybe we can open it up to the floor for the for the other commissioners. Are there are there questions that people want to bring up? Vice Chair Ennis. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much. I was not familiar with so much of what you shared, so this was really helpful for me to understand what the offerings are. Uh, I was wondering how this compares within the UC system. Do we have more students that use this than other UCs? Are you communicating with, uh, I, I, I assume, similar positions in the other campuses that are working on the same issues? What does that look like? Well, um, it is both very coordinated and also all over the map, as you can imagine between the different UCs. So we meet monthly, all of the people in uh, similar positions to mine around the UC. And then, and then um, we each campus has a basic needs um, committee and that, that has people like from financial aid, from uh, counseling services, all, all the different areas. And so those teams meet regularly as well. So we all, and we all are doing very similar things. Now we're also like all over the map because um, somewhere like UC Merced doesn't have a brick and mortar center and we do. 
um, and a lot has to do with the leadership at those campuses and what they prioritize. Um, we all get a certain amount of money from the state um, basic needs education budget or the state education budget and it's a basic needs allocation. Um, that was $15 million split amongst all the UCs. It was split equitably. So based on the research that was done, how many homeless, how many, what's your housing and security number, what's your food and security number, that money was split equitably. So not all campuses got the same amount. Um, for better or worse, UC Davis was in the, the higher end of those campuses that needed that. Um, but so how do we compare? Um, I think we do pretty well. We have a chancellor who is 100% committed to basic needs and um, helping our students in this area. And I can't say that of all the chancellors, um, but the money goes where it's supposed to go. Um, commitments are made and kept. Uh, we're, we're doing pretty well in that area. We're the only campus that has our own uh, college-focused rapid rehousing program. Uh, I think more are gonna be following our lead, but, um, but that's, that's something we're really excited about. And we, we are the only campus that has that um, housing subsidy program as well for 150 beds, which I would like to see, you know, I would even go for less beds, more money. Um, but, but the fact that that is sustainable and the campus has committed to taking that on is, is like far and away, no other campus is doing that. Could you share a little more on what you just said about the less beds, more money, and how you think about that? Because that's that's that would be interesting to hear your thinking. Sure. I mean, right now, because of just because of the, a lot of the planning for this and the way that um, that just the way that it came about, it was fifteen percent of new beds on campus. So that restricts it to the beds at the green, which are the new beds. Mm -hmm. Now, I would rather not restrict it to any one location. I'd rather have it go with the students, right? Uh, so no matter where they live, I would like to be able to just give them a rental subsidy. And we can on an individual basis, right? Like a student comes to us and says, hey, I need some help. We can provide that. But, but this program. So, so it's out at the green, 150 beds, $100 for each. Now, one way of thinking about that is a modest, a modest kind of uh, subsidy in conjunction with other things that, that help. And I 100% appreciate that. Um, I like the idea of less beds with more help that maybe we could get people out of cars um, I can't promise anything, but I'm, um, I'm hopeful that we're going to be able to keep the subsidy exactly the way it is, 150 beds, $100 each, and do another program that will substantially decrease the amount of students uh, living in cars. So, so I'm hopeful we can do both, and that's what we're going for. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Perez? I'm curious about the ways in which these services help um, the students' families. So um, as a student, as someone who was also a graduate student at, um, at UC Davis and had a family and was supporting a family and needed housing for my family, you know, for the four years I was there, um, how are these services extended to those individuals, you know, partner and children who, you know, brought their lives so that that person can get their education. So I have so much to say about this. Um, most of it, uh, good news. Um, but yeah, this is, this is a, a, an area like a, a, a piece of the pie that is, that needs more attention and that often gets overlooked. So you know that, um, but one of the reasons for expanding that definition of basic needs was is so that we can expand the audience that we actually spend those state dollars on. 
Because the definition is the way it is, we can only spend state dollars on helping students directly with housing and food. And that's wonderful. However, we have student uh, families that might need help with um, uh, medical care for their children or child care. Uh, we currently can't spend any of that state money on it. We can only spend uh, donor money. So, so that's one thing. Another thing is uh, last year with the CARES money that came in and we um, pushed a lot of our basic needs direct aid for students in with the CARES money and we're able to award uh, student parents $500 per dependent, not just child, but dependent. Uh, and we're able to automatically award these families even before they asked for additional help. That was during COVID. Um, this year, um, Aggie Compass was able to provide uh, a similar grant, which should have, cross your fingers, gone out last week. Um, and initially that was just $500 per parent, but we have been able to increase that, I think to, I don't know if we went as far as $500 per dependent, but I think we got close. I think we got, um, I think we got to maximum of $1,000. Um, we support the Solano Park uh, pantry and as Solano Park is raised, um, I'm currently talking with housing to hopefully um, be able to get more services for students, uh, student parents and families over at Pomero Grove. I know that in the fall, one of the biggest wait lists we have is for student families. Um, but for the rest of the services, I will say that all of Aggie Compass services and grants are available to graduate students, and undergraduate students. Um, and a lot of families are um, from graduate student parents. So that is accessible to everybody. Um, if, it's, if it's something like a federal program like CalFresh, sometimes that's not, most of the time it's not available to grad students. So we're trying to affect that policy at a, a, with the USDA now, not me personally, but our, our uh, basic needs committee chair. Um, and we also are in partnership with the Women's, Women's uh, Resource and Retention Center, who's doing a lot of good work for student families. Thank you so much for all that you do. I know how hard it was to be a student family. And I also had a newborn while a student. So um, I'm just really grateful. We lived at Orchard Park and um, that was one of the most memorable and joyful times. Wow, you did a lot. You, you, that is so hard. Congratulations. Thank you, Commissioner Perez and Leslie. Are there other questions from the commissioners? So I actually have a few questions, Leslie. Maybe I'll, I'll um, go from narrow to broad, if that's okay. Uh, so the first question is, your hair looks great. It's, it's I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> I, I've been experimenting with this kind of straight up thing, but. I don't it's, know. Good. It's, it's good. It's, oh, no, it's good. It's good. It's like there, good. There's that's an old standby right there. there. <laughs> uh, the first question is, you know, when you learn about the causes of what's leading to food insecurity and housing insecurity, do you see patterns emerge where it's the same kind of determinants of housing insecurity that are leading to, to food insecurity? Or is there something about the character of what's happening? that leads to precarious housing versus not having enough food or high quality food? Well, I, you know, it's, it's a mix. I think students uh, have to pick housing first and then they don't have food. You know, they don't, they, they can't stretch their budget to pay for the food. And then they have to make choices between um, paying their school bills so that they can register uh, and eating or stretching money to last till the end of the month. I think that's how we usually see um, these things present themselves. Um, 
However, we're seeing more and more students coming to campus with a, a housing plan that is living in their cars or purchasing a van and living in their van. Now, some of that is, a, we've had students that are well, well prepared, if you will, you know, like they, we had one student who uh, decided he was gonna live in his van. So he went and bought a tricked out like RV style van and lived in it. Um, and then we have students who choose choose to, although I, I use that term loosely, live in their cars and are not well equipped to be doing that. Uh, even the student who was living in his van, uh, he was broken into several times and we ended up rehousing him into, uh, during COVID into one of the res halls. Um, and I think it was a combination of uh, the break-ins and, um, and COVID that finally convinced him, but we couldn't convince him to come into housing. Um, so I think that the housing market in the country and the housing market in California, and then in Davis. So, I mean, it's not, the, it's not just Davis, obviously, it's everywhere, but um, I, think, I think that's squeezing people out and causing them to rethink the housing part of it so they have enough money to be able to have food and the other amenities. Um, I also think that there are, and we know this, the research has, has borne it out, that there are certain at-risk populations and those are um, LGBT, um, low-income students, first-generation students, um, student parents, um, these are the students that are at risk and, and Unfortunately, we can't do anything about those, right? We, we, we can't affect a, a student's LGBT status that will help them not be in a risk category. Um, similarly for all of those things. Um, and giving a student access to a free pantry does not make them food secure. It makes them food insecure, but they had a place to get some food today, right? So, so yeah, we see patterns. We see how this happens. We see how one affects the other, and it's like it's like dominoes. You know, finances go with housing and food security, and when one is affected, the other is usually affected. And when these all three of those are affected, you get this chronic stress that that we know from the research affects mental health. Mental health affects GPA. It affects retention. It affects graduation rates. So it's, you know, you, you have to look at that problem in a holistic way in, ter you know, in terms of the challenge, but also in terms of the, the resources. And just really quickly on this car population that is kind of resistant Obviously, you don't want somebody knocking on your car windows. So that's that's clear. Just the the sort of you know, being confronted part. But it also sounds like maybe there's some pattern you're seeing here. Do you know why there's resistance among this particular population? You know, I think it's one of those things. I think if you are a dis in a disadvantaged group, an underserved population one of the things that happens is you start to own where you're at. And I think a lot of students, um, not all, but this is based on kind of conversations with other, with my colleagues at other UCs, you know, they start to kind of own this. We are a, um, a community of students that have chosen to live in our cars. And we've chosen it for several reasons. I mean, instead of kind of the, we still have students who, who a crisis will come up and they, they kind of suddenly can't afford where they live, right? Or they're suddenly evicted. But it's that group of students who looks at it and says, hey, I can spend a thousand dollars a month on a place to stay while I'm in college 
uh, but I can't afford that. I'm not going to have any money for food or any money for social time. But if I take a couple thousand dollars and buy a car, then I don't have to pay any rent at all. I can park somewhere that I can get, um, you know, internet service and I can use the shower at Hickey Gym or the shower at the Ark and be just fine. I'm not going to want to, so we might come along and say, hey, you know, we can find you a place in Davis for 500 bucks. I've had a student say, I don't want to pay 500 bucks. Right now I pay zero and you want me to move into a place for 500 bucks. I have a plan. And, it, and we find that it's not until something happens like a break-in uh, or there's some physical health compromise, there's fires. So there are smoke, there's smoke in the city or a pandemic or something. Um, we have talked, you know, I have talked with the administration about safe parking. I think you're going to see that coming up kind of year after year. It's been resisted by the UCs because it is not, and I tend to agree with this, it's not an, an acceptable way to house our houseless students by giving them a parking lot to park their cars in. You know, let's give them a place to stay, you know. Um, I, and this brings me to my biggest challenge is right now, it is very difficult. We know the students are out there, but it's been very difficult to find them. And we've been put on hold for this last year. So we have some resources to address this issue and to really affect change. But if you, if you look at the numbers, it says we should have 200 homeless students this is before the pandemic, living in, living in cars or in other places. But if you ask me at the center, we have like eight. Because I can't, you know, so we're really wrestling with this problem right now because we have some resources to, to address this. And you'll, you'll see some um, campaigns coming out in the fall to try and locate these students. We've got a research project going on over the summer to try and find better ways to reach out to them. And uh, if the other commissioners wanna jump in and have other questions, please interrupt me. I just have a, just a couple more. Um, yeah, I'll pipe in here a little yeah. bit too. Leslie, it's nice to see you again. I was here when you came in and talked with us the first time and wow, have you come a long ways, huh? There's a tremendous number of programs added in from when we first listened to you. Um, I'm really impressed by the housing program. Uh, one of the things I would ask is, uh, when did the rapid rehousing actually start and the housing listing start? Um, what, what time frame was that? The rapid rehousing launched September 15th this last year. So se September 15th, 2020. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I think my team and the university were super excited about it and no students were here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this year we should see uh, a little bit more. And uh, the housing listing, are you talking about the subsidy? Um, well, under when you show the, the web page, I don't have it up on my computer right now, but under housing, there was housing list was one of the categories. Uh, um, and I'm assuming that's where landlords are putting information about housing. I don't know. I'm, I'm, you know what, right now we're just list, we are listing, um, Dave, city of Davis fair housing services, affordable rental information provided by the city and the Yolo County uh, housing list. We have the uh, ASUCD community housing listing. Um, unfortunately, that project is, mm, let's see, we need to, we have been encouraging ASUCD <laughs> to uh, get excited about kind of uh, rejuvenating that. Okay. Project, because that's a very, very helpful project. And I think that's what you're talking about, where uh, the, the property managers in Davis list with the community housing listing, and there's a Davis model lease and um, that sort of thing. Yeah. 
So I guess one of the questions I have is probably you've already really answered it. You've had difficulty rolling this out, but how have you rolled the information out? Um, I mean, it's, it, it is all news to me, not that I would necessarily know. I'm not a student, I'm not on campus, but I mean, we are part of the community and gosh, it just feels like the more of us that know this, I mean, I interact with students on a daily basis, you know, and um, just even being able to help them with, did you know, you know kind of thing, you know? Um, yeah, we're working with um, Student Affairs Marketing Communications this summer to really get the word out there. Um, as you can imagine, we stalled this last year with COVID. Um, and so we're really pushing hard. Um, this fall will be, you know, our real push to get everything out there so students are aware of it. And then I guess my last question <clears throat> would be, is there collaboration directly with the city? I mean, we've got sort of a, an office of you know, with the uh, city of Davis on rental information and, and help, you know, with landlords, things like that. Is there collaboration between what is showing uh, on your website and what you folks are doing with the city too? Well, we were working with Ryan Collins mm -hmm. um, and I hope, um, I, I'm not sure how to get an update necessarily on who or when, like whose replacement is or when that'll happen. Um, but I am excited for that to happen and hoping that we can uh, collaborate and have um, uh, even a stronger relationship in that area. We're ready to go. We, we want to partner with that, uh, the person in that position. Uh, like, I think we have a lot to learn from the person in that position about homelessness in Davis and about um, how our students show up there and how we can, um, how we can kind of work together to, to, to get that, uh, to kind of get that right. Um, so we're really excited about that. Um, and if there is someone else like in a different position that anyone here thinks that we ought to be working with, that we can collaborate with on announcing these things or on kind of cross promoting uh, services, please let me know, let's, let's get that done. Is your email address just lkemp at ucdavis.edu? Put a C in there, LC Kemp. Okay. At UC Davis. And if I could just jump in here, um, we are just so the commission is aware, uh, the position that Ryan Collins was in, we are working to fill that. Um, we also have another person who was in our rental resources program, who, who was our rental resources program. It's a half time position, and she just recently retired. So we're working to fill that position as well. And Leslie, if you um, haven't been able to work directly with rental resources, I would definitely want to connect you with whomever is in that position once we fill it, um, because it sounds like the legal desk that you guys have put together would be yep. um, a really good complement to, to what we're trying to do on our end. So the more the merrier where that's concerned. That's great. And I just wrote that down. Um, yep, I had something brilliant to say there, but uh, but it's gone. Let's say I have a, a couple more things. One. Um, oh, hold on, hold on. Oh, I remember. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember. Um, so, with our rapid rehousing program, we have the Lutheran Social Services case manager who was assigned, uh, who was hired for us and now uh, works directly with our team. So, they will be placing students in. Um, in the green in the specific amount of rooms that we have there, but part of their job is to, that program is only three to six months. So part of what they do is place those students who are not graduating, place those students in permanent housing in the city of Davis. So connecting, and that wasn't such a big deal this last year, we had you know eight students, and maybe the total was like 12, some left, some came, right? But as we're looking forward to the fall, I think that connecting um, Ari with the rental resources person in the city of Davis will be like a key relationship uh, because she'll be placing more students in the city. 
sorry, and I didn't mean to interrupt. It just no, no, thank you. It doesn't you. stay in it's here good. very long. No, that's like, great. Get it out. Get it out. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, keep it, keep it churning. Uh, I had a I had a question. So you're, I'm sure, familiar with the uh, kind of affordable housing landscape in in Davis and. One of the challenges from a data perspective is, you know, so we have this regional housing needs um, assessment process where we try to figure out how many extremely low and very low income people um, need, need uh, subsidized housing, affordable housing, and then the city zones for that um, to try to, and tries to get, get it built eventually. But one of the challenges is that as far as I know, we don't have a, great sense of a what percentage of that number is students versus non-students which seems like that could be figured out um, but we I, as far as i've seen we don't have that very clearly uh, in our heads the second thing is that uh, and by the way all of this kind of ties to the by the bed rental model that we're you know because clearly that might work for students it might not work for other students who have families or other you know and, and it you know, certainly doesn't work for people who aren't students generally. You know? So it's making sure that as we're zoning and as we're building, we're not just filling one homogenous number, we're making sure there's enough kinds of units to fill the needs of, of say families or others, you know? which is, it's difficult, right? Because developers nowadays find these by the bed rentals workable from an affordable housing perspective, but that may not be meeting the need of others. But, but the second piece of data, which I'm wondering if you have any insight on is, you know, Davis, when you look at the numbers, has a high poverty rate, has a high CalFresh, you know, um, enrollment rate, all this. And this is due to the fact that we're um, a university city where there are a lot of genuinely low income students. And then there are students who whose personal income is low, but they're receiving uh, possibly unreported or, or income from the parents otherwise. So, so they kind of qualify as under the poverty line, qualify as low income. And I'm wondering if you have any insight about how to distinguish that in thinking about this low income number and the kinds of housing people require and how you, you deal with it. You know, from your perspective, it seems like students are coming to you. So, so clearly they're in need, but there's also must be a need to kind of have a more bird's eye picture of, Yes, we as UC Davis, we have a certain number of low income students, but how many of you know how many of those are actually kind of basic needs targets and do we need to really make sure that we address the needs of? I mean, that's the million dollar question right there. You know, how do you um, qualify students for aid? Um, I want to address something you the first thing you said. Um, you may need to remind me of the second thing because I have things there too. But one of the things that you mentioned earlier was what percentage of homeless in Davis are students? And yes, I think we can address that. I think we can do that with a pit survey, a point in time survey. And I know Ryan did that every year with the exception of this last year. Um, and we have been trying to get in on that to um, have the city train our street team so that we can help with that survey and that we can add in a question about are you a student or not um, but we don't we don't know how to do that right now on our own so we and, and I think it'd be more efficient if we did it with the city so I just wanted to to put that out there and say yes I think that we can get numbers on that I think it matters um, because the solutions are different they do overlap Okay, so the other part that you were talking about was how we qualify, you know, how do you qualify students? Um, and, and it really is, it is the, the million dollar question. So there, there are really two ways we go about it and, and they're both legit and neither, neither one is perfect. There, um, one of the ways we do it, and this usually is around money as a resource. And that is that we take a look at, uh, through financial aid, all the money that a student has coming in. And that includes money that their parents are um, 
kind of required to pay estimated family contribution. And every student is required to pay a certain amount as well. And then we look at the loans that they've got, the grants that they've got, their entire financial aid package. And we can see uh, the students that are most in need. So that's one way that we qualify them. Another, and, and, and that, like I said, is legit. Okay, what it leaves out are students who are supposed to get help from their families, but they don't, right? So the, their family has um, a, you know, 10% estimated family contribution and their family doesn't make it. Um, it doesn't take into account any emergencies that a student might have. It doesn't take into account that um, low income students tend to get qualify for more loans, which puts them in more debt when they come out of the university. And these students tend to be of the underrepresented minority status. And so their um, the jobs that they get coming out of the university pay less than a student who is less encumbered by debt. So they are less likely to pay off their student loans quickly. They're less likely to be able to pay their student loans, right? So what is our responsibility as a basic needs unit to not um, have our students be so buried in debt? Our most, uh, this is my daughter. Hi, Ellie, bye. It's gonna be a minute. Um, so how do we, no, How do we, um, so what's our responsibility, right? To help out these, these students. And so what, um, what we've done in the past is sometimes equality. So I spoke about the student parents and giving every student parent $500 per child. That's not equitable. Some student parents might have all the money they need. Some might need $2,500. Um, so what we're looking at right now is developing, again, we're doing a lot over the summer, but developing a set of questions that really asks students to report their circumstances rather than where they're supposed to be right now, and rather than requiring them to what we might call perform their poverty. So write an essay about how badly your life has gone in the last year or why you deserve money, um, but rather ask them questions like, have you skipped meals in the last 30 days? Have you had difficulty paying your rent? How much money would help you pay your rent every month? Um, and I come from kind of a more skeptical background, right? The one where there's scarcity all around and there's not enough for everybody and you do have to perform your poverty and you're probably scamming the system anyway. And it has been a very humbling journey for me over the past five to 10 years to be at a place where um, I feel that every student deserves to have a meal. Every student deserves to not have to skip a meal uh, because they had to choose whether to pay a bill or not. Um, and I believe that self-reporting is important and that finances don't show the whole picture. Um, and I think that you'll see this at almost all of the UCs as well as we address these concerns. But I do wanna say that it is valid to struggle with this idea of how many, like if somebody's given out free lunch, everybody's gonna take it, I'm gonna take it and I don't need it, you know? So 
how do we figure out who needs it? It is a struggle, but we're, we want to err on the side of everybody eating. Well, you know, one thing that I would love if you'd keep on your radar is that, you know, the city of Davis, like most other cities, is struggling to just meet the affordable housing need. And that a certain amount of the units that we are designated, that are designated as affordable housing are these, um, you know, kind of single by the bed rentals. Um, and it may or may not be the case that the low, the low income students are accessing these, it, low income in the actual genuine sense of need. So just, you know, there's perhaps if, if things occur to you about, it seems like you have data that can get into that, but perhaps there's, there's a way to kind of um, work together to, to, to see whether the students that you have data about what their housing situation is and whether they've successfully accessed, uh, you know, legally affordable housing, sort of legally mm -hmm. set aside affordable housing. Yeah. So, and just work backward and try to figure out, you know, do we need more? You know, it's not like we want to kick people out of, you know, the housing, but it's just, you know, there's only, there's not enough units. And if they're not actually being used by low income students, that's the problem. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I just, um, I'm also on the board of Davis Community Meals and Housing. We had a, a groundbreaking for Paul's place today. Um, and, you know, the biggest takeaway from that event besides the, the you know, hurrah and let, let's get going is that there's not enough affordable housing in Davis. Yeah. Uh, so yes, there needs to be more, um, but point taken and I will, uh, I will think about what you're saying for sure. And the last question from my end, which is very broad, is what do you need from the city? You know, there's the Social Services Commission in particular, who, you know, we have this kind of convening ability. We have the ability to, to you know, help bring speakers and, and try to create events and workshops and all that. We also have the ability to recommend uh, to city council what should be done about some of these issues. So there's us and then there's the city more broadly. What are your needs? Well, a couple of things um, in the short term and the kind of most urgent thing that, I, that I'm thinking about now is collaboration with that, um, with the uh, homeless coordinator that Kelly was mentioning and the um, rental resources department. I mean, that's the most pressing, right? Let, let's find the, um, the students who are homeless and you know, it's almost like that's low hanging fruit. You know what I mean? Like, like we've got some resources. Let's get these students into places. So let, let's collaborate on that. That's, that's number one. But I think in the bigger picture, as we go along, I think that the potential for the city of Davis, social services, and in a basic needs arena to collaborate with UC Davis and basic needs is tremendous, it's tremendous. So we are developing a food recovery program on campus. We have a small food recovery program now that the good students of the Food Recovery Network are doing. But let, we are expanding that on campus to try and feed more of our own students through our own food waste, right? Um, and food waste, what I mean is recovering food that doesn't need to be wasted. Right. Well, so how can we collab with the city to make to to um, help Davis restaurants recover more of their food and direct that to the population in the city? Right. How can we develop these programs in tandem? Um, Feeding America, uh, their number one way to they have said end food insecurity end hunger in the United States is through food recovery. We throw away more food than we need to feed the people in this country. So let's partner on that. And, and I mean, there's potential there, right? There's potential um, with housing to partner more in terms of uh, having students relocate to the cities. And that, that is a ball that we've dropped with ASUCD and the housing listing but we'll need to revive that and develop relationships on the city side in that area. Um, how can UC Davis help to pump more money into the Davis economy in terms of we give out um, 
This year I gave out over $200,000 in grocery gift cards, right? So those went to 60% of our students were not in Davis, right? So those went out to some students in Davis and a lot of students not living on campus. Well, that program's not gonna get any smaller and all of our students are gonna be back. So wouldn't it be cool to have something that, you know, a card that could be used at Davis restaurants or at Davis, like the co-op or at Safeway or at Trader Joe's, right? That a student in need could use in Davis specifically, right? Um, I haven't thought all of that through, but the, but the partnering with the city, I think, I think there, it's just like a lot of great possibilities and fertile ground. Great, thank you, Leslie. I mean, those are all, I mean, there, there are some concrete ideas in there. It seems like food recovery is, is a big thing for you. And it seems like that there's just existing programs that you have and how do we expand those into the city environs and, and get students in? Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's yeah, great. we've been so, you know, I've been so like focused on kind of the problem at hand, A, getting the center up and running and B, like, getting those students who are in crisis lifted up to being only at risk, yeah. right? And so then trying to get stable and then now kind of saying, okay, we're kind of stable. Let's yeah. look to partnering outside. Let's look a little bit outside our own little family. So, so just now starting to do that. Great. But I appreciate um, this commission and I appreciate being invited back and Please email me with any ideas and collaborations and come visit the center. We're open for visits now, but it's not that exciting. In the fall, it'll be more exciting. Um, yeah, come see us. Great. Thank you. Do other commissioners have questions or comments they wanna make before we take public comment? Great, and Dago, is there anyone who wishes to comment? I'm seeing hands raised. Great. Well, Leslie, thank you again for taking the time uh, to come and, and educate us about this. And I think we're all interested in the possibilities of collaboration. So uh, it's great to know that there's somebody who's a champion. It feels like an opportunity that you're there uh, and that the Basic Needs Center is there. So we'll, we'll definitely be in touch. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. See you next year or the year after or whenever. Thank you. Great, uh, and now we're going to go to subcommittee updates, which we, I don't think we'll have very many since we're in the process of reorganizing the subcommittees, affordable housing. Georgina, do we have anything? No, I mean, it was the housing trust fund, the housing element, you know, so I kind of made my comments at the beginning of the meeting, but you know, thanks for checking. Yep, uh, and Matthew and Susan, I don't think we have anything on evidence research grants at this point. Awareness and Outreach, Vice Chair Ennis. No, okay. And I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna check real quickly with, with Rachel if you wanna share anything. But oh, I'm sorry, Rachel, you're on the committee now too. Yeah, we actually, um, uh, I don't know if it makes sense to actually talk about it now, but we actually did do a draft survey for um, reaching out and looking at the landscape for social services programs across Davis and in Yellow County. So we do have a draft that I don't know if it makes sense to actually go over with people now or if we wait until next month. Um, and do it then. So, do people have because of the that? turnover, I'm thinking it might be, you know, if this is something that you're going to get feedback and then revise, it might yeah. be good to wait until next month. And okay. We'll, we'll Sounds good. Yeah. And uh, Susan, Matthew, I don't think we have anything on public health and safety then. Okay. Uh, any public comment, Tago, on this one? In no hands raised. Okay, well, let's move on to commission and staff communications, development projects, affordable housing properties update. Sorry, just trying to balance the minutes and the screen. Um, it's actually been a very interesting year. We were swamped with all manner of um, refinances and sales and questions about things for affordable units in about February, which um, 
I'm guessing Georgina would say as a, a realtor is an odd, not the busiest time. And right now it's actually pretty quiet. We have a, a couple of properties that are, um, I think uh, two that are refinancing, um, a couple of owner occupancy uh, declarations. And then I think um, one or two that are on, um, on a for sale or starting that process. So it's actually relatively quiet, particularly for this time of year. I'm not sure what that means or says, but. Okay. Uh, and then we'll move on to, the, <coughs> excuse me, the long range calendar. Can you see that? Yep. Okay. Any, any thoughts on the long range calendar? It might be a good idea actually, uh, you know, not to get too specific about what we do this fall until the new commissioners come and next meeting we can sort of talk. Uh, it seems like we have a full agenda for July. Are there any other things, priorities that um, anybody else wants to add? Okay. In that case, I think we're good to go for now on the long range calendar, Dago. And maybe we can take public comment really quick um, and then move on to any kind of commissioner feedback from the departing commissioners. No hands raised. No hands raised. Okay, great. And we come to the end. Uh, commissioner Valencia, Commissioner Wise, we would love to hear your wisdom, your warnings, uh, what worked, what didn't, what you think, what you wish could have gone differently and how we might make a uh, you know, hospitable environment for the new commissioners to feel impactful and for the commission as a whole to feel impactful. Matt, you're, you're senior here. Why don't you start out with your thoughts? <laughs> Thanks, Georgina. Well, um, I, I'm not sure that I have a lot of words of wisdom. I, I just, I want to say a couple of things to all of you because, um, you know, we've become friends over the years and have, um, you know, had an opportunity to meet outside of just the commission meetings. Um, and, and I'm sorry that I didn't get to know Rachel better because I know we have some mutual friends that speak very highly of her and, um, so I'm sorry we didn't have a chance to work together too much uh, on this commission, but I would imagine that we're going to run into each other at some point uh, in other contexts. So, um, so anyway, I, you know, you you all are doing such good work. I can speak as as Georgina was saying from perspective of having been on the commission for almost ten years, and I'm sure that Don would say the same thing. I mean, the the work that that this commission is doing right now is is so impressive and. Um, you know, a, a lot of it's, as we all know, starts with, with you, Bapu, um, the um, amount of time that you've put in doing the, the research and the networking, um, it, it's just made a tremendous difference. Uh, and, and I think because of that, everybody's talents have been able to come out and, um, and, and have, you know, come through and the work that we've done and, I, you know, over the years, I think the, you know, most meaningful contribution that I was able to make was most recently in the work uh, related to, to reimagining public safety. And, and that was, you know, in large part due to, to Bapu's good work and, um, you know, getting, getting Susan and, and me on board and uh, in the, into a place where we could make meaningful contributions. So I really appreciate that. And I think everybody is, is contributing and in a meaningful way now because um, there are identifiable projects and um, you know specific goals that the commission has and they are focused and narrow enough that the commission can have a meaningful impact um, and that has not always been the case so i would just encourage you to continue um, down that road um, because you're, you're definitely on the right path and, and you're doing meaningful work um, I mean, you know, the perspective that I think I brought to the commission that 
was a little bit different than um, some commissioners and we'll see what the new commissioners are like. I don't know that I know any of them personally, but you know, I would just encourage you to think a little bit about the work that staff puts into each staff report, um, into you know all behind the scenes, uh, the work that our city council members are doing. We've got a really terrific, um, I think, public interest-minded city council, um, and 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 really um, continue to think about the hard work that they're doing. Um, as we offer input, because it it is really important for us to, um, you know, take a uh, a really critical approach to all of the issues that we face. But um, you know, I would I would hope that we don't lose sight of <laughs> all of the work that they're doing, and um, that they have an informed opinion uh, that you know that they're sharing with us, and and you know, council is taking a bigger perspective sometimes on the issues that they face. And so um, I tried to bring that to our discussions and I know that that probably frustrated people at times because uh, it is a more institutional perspective and sometimes that can run up against the change that needs to happen. Um, but I think it's an important perspective to have too and, and you know, to not lose sight of. Um, because if, you know, if all we do is kind of rock the boat, <laughs> then, you know, we might not make evidence-based decisions or, you know, uh, make as meaningful of an impact or be able to kind of see the broader community uh, and their views in the decisions that we make. And um, so, so that was... That's, that's the only caution that I have, but I, as far as I can see, I, I think our commission for the last couple of years and the members that are continuing on, you know, do, do bring that perspective. And I would just encourage you to continue to, to take into account those views. Well, I don't know that I can say anything any better than what you offered, Matt. I think that was, um, you know, well stated. Um, I think the thing that I would share is that, you know, I had no idea when I got on the Social Services Commission, um, really what the inner workings of the city was. Um, you know, um, I'll say, you know, staff's role in supporting us, kind of all those components. I really feel like I sort of learned it as we went. Um, and that's just kind of the challenge anytime, whether you're, you know, a new a volunteer on a commission or new in a job, whatever it is, there's always sort of a learning curve. And um, I mean, I have to say, you know, through all that, I, I learned very much what you were talking about, Matt, and that is that, you know, staff has a lot of things on their plate, and it's not all just focused on what our commission talks about. And so I appreciate, um, you know, we have and Kelly and Dago too, we have some very quality um, staff members that are supporting us. So um, I think we're very lucky that way. Um, I guess I'd also add that, you know, the, this body, the commission has changed dramatically in the five and a half years. So I've been on the commission five and a half years. I really thought my husband and I argued about this. He said, oh no, you've only been on two or three years. Five and a half years. And um, the commission has changed the face of it. You know, the conversation has changed dramatically in that time, I believe. And I think all for the better. Um, so, you know, that I'm really pleased about. I think Matt, you, and I wish Don was here too, you know, to put in 10 years, 11 years of your life volunteering in this capacity. And I know you do other community service um, efforts. That's huge, it really is. So I really applaud you for that. Um, if somebody had asked me, would I be on this commission for five and a half years? I would have never imagined that. But the time in many ways has kind of sailed by, you know? Um, I think one of the things I would hope that this commission would do is, it feels to me like more and more of the discussions we're having of late, you know, housing really is at the, at the root 
of giving security to people. And my hope is that the little bits of inroads that we've made with our conversation about affordable housing, um, managing our affordable housing, managing programs, you know, uh, the, the priorities that we um, talked about, again, within that housing trust fund, that we don't lose sight of it and let that momentum and those ideas go, that we keep coming back to them as a commission. It won't be we as in me anymore, but my hope is that you will stay at it and keep at it and keep the ideas present and focused um, because I do think that they're really important and I'd hate to see this commission lose that momentum. Um, and finally, I'm gonna be a little philosophical because I love this quote, okay? And that is, you know, well, um, I'll say my time and I'm sure there's times when you've been on the commission that you feel like you're not making any direct change. Um, just know that your commitment and ideas and stating them does make change. But as Martin Luther King said, um, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. So service on this commission and other commissions, I think it's much like that quote, really. It takes a long time, it takes a long view. And that's probably been part of my weakness. I don't have necessarily that long view. So um, anyways, I appreciate, appreciate you all and um, thank you for my time on the commission. Thanks for that, Georgina and Matthew. And it's a shame that Don couldn't be here, but um, I think we all know what he would say in his closing statement, which is build more units. Probably a little, a little more firmly than that. Affordable, we, we, affordable, affordable units. Affordable. Affordable. <laughs> they have to be affordable. affordable. Right. More housing. Affordable. <laughs> yeah. Which I think is is a powerful message. And I, and I do appreciate, you know, I think it's, um, I. You know, there are very many ways in which the members of this commission, vis-a-vis -vis each other, vis-a-vis -vis staff, city council members can get frustrated with each other, right? It's just part of the game. We have different views on things. We have different styles. And um, and I would just like to say this about Commissioner Coleman, while we're being recorded on the record, you know, it's like he sometimes, you know, it, it can be frustrating to for people to hear that one note. But the truth is that note is really, really, really important. And his willingness to be strident and vocal and consistent, regardless of how people perceived it, I think has had an impact. And I'd like to, you know, just acknowledge that um, even in his absence. Uh, Georgina, you know, if I can just say, you know, it's been, um, I, I would just like to say thank you for taking me kind of under your wing as far as housing is concerned. I, I knew very little about housing entering and most of what I've learned is in some way, either directly or indirectly because of you. So um, in, in that way, I know there's been times, like you said, where you've been frustrated uh, with the pace of change in our city and the commission. And, um, you know, despite that, your, your, your uh, efforts were unflagging. And I think your, your steadiness of purpose was inspiring to me. So, um, and and the amount of just, I think, work that went into the Housing Trust Fund document will, will live uh, on. And I think um, you've provided us kind of with a vision in that document that will inform us going forward. So thank you so much, um, personally and, and you know for your work and just for personally for the for the way that you are. You know your 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 your, your kindness and your patience with everything. Uh, Matthew, yeah, I, you know, it's for both you, Georgina and Matthew, it's just, you know, I believe in the idea of turnover, you know, it's great to give new people new opportunities, but the losses are huge. Um, you know, I've worked with both of you very closely and Matthew, it's just like, I think, uh, yes, there will be people who will represent your perspective and not just the institutional perspective, but the precision and the commitment to evidence. And I think the fair mindedness, the ability to, I think, um, see all perspectives and, and arrive at a place where you have your view, but only after the consideration of all perspectives. That's super hard. It's very, very hard. And it's frankly not easily replaceable. So, um, you know, yes, it's great that people are giving you an opportunity, but it's just a tremendous loss to this commission, everything you bring and with everything else going on in your life too. Um, and I was witness to it firsthand during the public safety process to always be willing to somehow find the time to, to put in work um, and write so beautifully that 
doesn't require any edits at all uh, and just you know do things extremely well um, it's just been wonderful so so thank you so much I hope that we'll remain friends and connected I hope that um, you guys show up in public comments often <laughs> reminding us of what we've forgotten and thank you so much for your service and I hope it it continues in the years ahead Anything else that commissioners would like to say or bring up before we? Apu, would it be um, okay if I said a couple of things? Yes, please. So somewhat somewhat reiter reiterating what you have already said, but I feel I would be remiss given all of the years that I have worked both with Matthew and with Georgina um, off and on at, with this particular commission. But Matthew, just thank you again for your even and thoughtful approach. Um, you're always you're always measured and you're always um, thoughtful in, in how you uh, share your your questions, your thoughts, etc. Um, even when the, the debate is heated, um, you've sometimes brought up ideas that have caused the commission to change the uh, the direction that they were headed um, or made them think as a group. Um, sort of the the 12 angry men approach um, minus the angry part and you always bring great knowledge to the table so um, I will miss that and wish you wish you well um, Georgina you have brought a passion specifically for affordable housing to this commission and I think really moved the commission in a direction um, where when you started there was a lot of focus on the CDBG and the home grants, which is fine, but um, some of the conversations and the knowledge base of the commission, I think, have really deepened because of your interest in affordable housing and your and your expertise in that particular area. So you've really caused the commission, I think, to become a greater advocate for affordable housing um, uh, overall, which is you know part of this, I think, shift that the commission has taken. So anyway, both of your um, your expertise, your expertises, it's not a word, uh, your expert, the expertise of both of you will be missed as, as Bapu already said. And just from a staff perspective, I thank you for all of the time, all of the input um, and the, the many hours that you've taken away from your families to help the city out for um, the huge paycheck that we give you. Oh. So thanks. Thanks, Kelly. We'll miss you guys. Commissioner Wise, would you like to have a motion to adjourn? Oh, well, I, I, and I want to thank Kelly and, and Dago. And um, you know, we were fortunate to have Danielle and uh, um, Adrian. <laughs> yeah, and Adrian. And Ginger. Ginger. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Over the years, really excellent staff. So we're, we're very fortunate to have good staff at, at the city. Um, yes, I will move to adjourn. And uh, Ex Chair Valencia, would you I'll second, second motion? that motion? <laughs> okay, let's take a vote. Commissioner Perez? Aye. I vote aye. Uh, Vice Chair Ennis? Yes. Commissioner Fulp Cook? Yes. Commissioner Valencia? Yes. And Commissioner Wise? Yes. Motion passes 6 0. Thank you for your service and good night. Good night. Good night. Thank good you, night. everybody. Thank you.